Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this, the third Sunday in the season of Advent when we celebrate the light of hope. I'd like to remind you uh, to take and sign the friendship pad that you'll find at the end of the pew. Sign your name and take note of those with whom you are seated so that you may greet them after the worship. Special welcome this morning today, of course, to any who are worshiping with us for the first time. Just a couple announcements to call your attention to. Um, The Advent Festival is after worship today, and I'd like to let you know that even if you did not sign up, you are welcome to attend. Um, There will be plenty for all and a good time decorating cookies and making wreaths together. The grief support group will meet tomorrow. Um, Cindy Bollock, he, as you know, had an accident, but uh, the Advent or the grief support group will be meeting. And um, also note the congregational meeting immediately following worship next Sunday to elect church officers. I'm Bill Reed, the uh, soon to be former chairman of the Buildings and Grounds Committee. (laughs) I'm just here today to announce that next Saturday will be our last work day of the year. And we've got three or four really neat projects. I've been told by certain staff members that there are a lot of cobwebs in certain places in the building, so we can go get those down. (laughs) But anyway, from 9 till 10, 10 10.30, whatever. We appreciate seeing all of you. I really appreciate all of the help that we've had the last several years on work days. So thank you much. Good morning. My name is Mary Thomas, and I'm the moderator of the Presbyterian Women um, St. James Association. I'd like to remind all of the women that, that we are changing our usual date for our Bible study and meeting this month. Instead of at the end of the month, we are having a meeting Tuesday, December 13th. So please be there. Um, We're having a special storyteller as well. Bye-bye. Certain staff member only mentioned one cobweb. (laughs) (laughs) It was impressive, though. (laughs) You should have seen it. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship our God. Please join me in the responsive litany. During Advent, God's light illuminates a weary world. For any who have grown weary of waiting, God speaks, peace be still. For any who are anxious about the worries of tomorrow, God speaks, peace be still. For any whose lips have been silenced, This morning, we light two candles. The first candle reminds us in a dark and weary world that our hope lies securely in the grace of truth of Jesus Christ. 
The second candle radiates God's perfect peace to calm our restless souls. As we continue our journey, let us be encouraged with hope, comforted with peace, and guided in truth. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our souls long for the peace that only you can provide. We confess that all too often, we only add to the discord, separation, and tension around us. Help us to feel your peace in our lives and strive to reflect it more in our witness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're comfortable doing so, please rise and join us in the hymn of praise, number 88, in your purple hymnal. Note that we're singing verses 1 through 4 and 7. The prophet Isaiah tells us that all have sinned, not one of us is clean, but there is mercy for those who call on the name of the Lord. 
Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. When our faith is rooted deeply in you, O God, our lives reflect your kingdom values of peace, justice, and righteousness. We confess, however, that we are so influenced by the values of the world that your priorities sometimes take second place. Forgive us, O God, and reconnect us to your Holy Spirit, the source of power and life. Strip our hearts and minds of all that prevents us from being firmly rooted in your love and grace. May our lives bear fruit worthy of our faith in you as we watch and wait for your breaking into our world once more. In the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Blessed be the Lord our God, who does wondrous things, the most wondrous of all, all being God's entry into our world in Jesus Christ, who came not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. be seated. If you take the cobwebs down, there'll be more flies and insects here. That's true. There will be even more. I'm sure there are some. Yes. Well, we are going to talk about animals today. Now that you bring it up, I have a picture to share with you. This is a picture I'm sure many of you out there have seen. It's a picture painting called the Peaceable Kingdom. You brought an animal. Does he have a name or she? Jimmy, that seemed sort of impromptu. That's, that's great, Jimmy. Can you see this picture? You want to move over a little bit so you can see? Or you know what? I'll move in between you. No? I have to sit there. Okay. Haley, you can sit on this side of me if you want. See, But you can see. Have you ever seen this picture before? Any of you seen this? So what do you notice about this picture? What kind of animals are there? Can you name any of them? Uh, just, just, just a minute. It's, uh, Gracie was talking. Okay, go ahead, Gracie. It's a lion. Uh -huh. Tiger. Okay, now go ahead. Oh, do you have more? Do you know what that one is? That's an ox. It is an ox. That is a homo sapien, you're right. <laughs> How about you, Haley? Can you name any of the animals? How about this, this, this one? Do you know what that one is? A cow. That's a cow, it is. That's a cheetah. A cheetah. Cheetahs are fast in the world. They are fast. That's That's a sheep. We have some very smart children. So do you usually see these animals together? Like if you were to go to the zoo, would you see a lion and a sheep together? No, the lion will probably eat the sheep. That probably would. And would you see a leopard and a calf together? No. No, not unless it was time for breakfast, right? Yeah. <laughs> but in this picture, they're all together. Because the man who drew this, he was drawing a picture of what one of the prophets in the Bible talks about. A time when... <laughs> All the animals would live together peacefully. And then did you notice, can Jimmy be still for a little while? Jimmy's got lots of energy. Let's hold him still. Okay. So 
Well, there's some people back here too in the picture. Did you notice that? Can you tell who those people are, Haley? Look close. Gracie, can you tell? Okay, how, how about Lance? Can you tell all those people? Can you tell who they are? Okay. I'll Native Americans, they are Native Americans and pilgrims. And, and the artist drew, and pilgrims, yeah, almost, almost like a Thanksgiving picture. But this was painted at a time when Native Americans and the rest of us here were not. Exist. No, they existed, but they weren't getting along. They were fighting. So he painted a picture where everybody and all the animals are getting along. Because that is what God wants for our world. So want, he wants us to help be peacemakers. Can you be a peacemaker, do you think? You think you can be a peacemaker? No? Not even a little bit? Any of you think you can be a peacemaker? Yes. How can you be a peacemaker? Hmm, heavy sigh. That's what we all think sometimes. <sighs> How would we do that? But you know, everybody can. You can, you can uh, play together nicely. You can share. Sometimes when you don't share, it causes problems. You can do everything you can uh, think of to get along well with other people. And it could start even with you. And you can learn those things when you're young. Okay, let's pray before you go to class. Loving God, we thank you for this beautiful picture of everybody and every, everything living together at peace. And we pray that in this season of peace that we would remember what it means to live as your people and to seek peace among ourselves. Be with the children as they go to class. Amen. Our lives are to bear the fruit of what we claim to believe. Our giving is one way we demonstrate our faithfulness. Let us freely and joyfully offer our gifts to God. Will the ushers please come forward?
God of grace, it is our delight and our devotion to give these gifts to you. All we are and all we have are yours alone. Accept this offering as a token of our faithfulness. Use it, we pray, to bring peace, justice, and comfort to all around the world. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is sure and true. Open our ears that we may hear you clearly. Open our minds that we may discern what you say. And open our hearts that we may accept your will for our lives. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's first lesson is from Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10, and can be found on page 640 in the Old Testament section of your Pew Bible. The Peaceful Kingdom. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of, un- of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with, the righteousness, with, right- but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord.
The second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew in the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. This may be found on page 2 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible, if you would like to read along. The proclamation of John the Baptist. Listen now to the word of God. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Last week, we lit our first candle in the Advent wreath, representing the light of hope. And this morning, we lit the second one, the light of peace. In reality, though, it is not possible to separate those two themes. In Scripture, hope and peace are intertwined, not neatly separated into distinct categories. In a sense, they are a package deal. So last week, we focused on the hope proclaimed by the prophets, taking our lesson from Isaiah chapter 2, which announces the coming day of the Lord when people will learn God's ways in order that they may walk in God's paths. And do you remember what it said about what it means to walk in God's paths? It means that people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and they will learn War no more. Hope and peace are inextricably joined in Scripture, first because peace is God's purpose for this world, and second because peace is humankind's greatest hope and deepest longing. And that is true for just about everyone, whether or not they consider themselves religious. The lectionary passage for today from the epistles, which we did not read this morning, also links hope and peace. That text from Romans ends with this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, hope and peace brought together. Well, Peter Gomes, who is a former, was a former minister at Harvard University, wrote a sermon for Advent based on that text from Romans. And he started with a reference to Sir Nicholas Henderson, a former British ambassador to the United States. This was at the height of the Cold War and around this time of year when a reporter asked him, Mr. Ambassador, what do you want for Christmas? And Sir Nicholas, a master of British reserve and understatement and not wanting to appear greedy, 
but wanting also to be truthful, replied to the reporter that all that he really wanted for Christmas was a jar of fruit preserved in ginger. Apparently, Gomes commented he liked that and hoped that Lady Henderson or somebody would give him just such a gift. Well, a few days later, the Washington Post ran a Christmas feature describing what various members of the diplomatic corps had asked for, or was what they were hoping to receive that year for Christmas. The Russian ambassador hoped for peace and goodwill. The Swiss ambassador for genuine disarmament around the world the Israeli ambassador for peace in the Middle East, and so on. You get the idea. And Sir Nicholas, it was reported, he was hoping for a jar of preserved fruit. Reverend Gomes points out that while Sir Nicholas expressed the most obtainable wish, wish and therefore probably got what he asked for, really did not hope enough. He did not hope, I would say, big enough. Because when we express our biggest hopes, our deepest dreams, our greatest yearnings, we do not ask for fruit preserves, do we? We ask for peace. That's what makes this image from today, today's Old Testament reading resonate so poignantly for most of us. And again, that is true whether or not one is religious. The longing for peace is universal, transcending religion and culture, nationality and language and that shared yearning for a world living together in harmony is wistfully and yet powerfully captured by the picture given in Isaiah of a wolf lying down with a lamb and the leopard and the calf and the lion, the lion all lying down together. It's an image that was captured by the Quaker minister and artist Edward Hicks in that famous painting that I shared with the children. It's one I, I believe probably most of you have seen, at least in one of its versions, because apparently he painted over a hundred versions of that particular scene. Did you know that? He would change the animals slightly, move the people around, move the child here or there in the picture. Well, that image of the peaceable kingdom took on a, some new meaning for me this year as a result of our Wednesday morning Bible study. We have been making our way through the book of Genesis, reflecting on the meaning of some very familiar stories, starting, of course, with the creation and the fall. And even though these stories are quite familiar to most of us, we've managed most weeks to discover something new. And there was something in the creation story that I hadn't really noticed before, or at least I had failed fully to appreciate. After creating the earth and the plants, the sun and the moon, the animals, and pronouncing it all good, and then creating human beings and instructing them to be fruitful and multiply, God tells the man and the woman that they have been given every plant yielding seed and every tree with seed in its fruit for food and says that God gave to the birds of the air and to every creeping thing green plants for food. Do you notice anything here? There is no permission given to kill and eat. No warrant for anyone, human or otherwise, to consume meat. It seems that in God's original design, everyone and everything was a vegetarian. All of God's creatures living together in peace, no one devouring his or her neighbor. Well, in the biblical, biblical account that changed after the flood, when Noah and his family emerged from the ark and the command to be fruitful and multiply was renewed, since, of course, they had to repopulate the earth. And this time around, this second time, God's provision changes now God tells the people that the fear and dread of them will rest upon every animal. Originally, they had given, been given only plants to eat, but now God also gives to them every living thing that moves for food. No longer is there peace between humanity and beast, nor harmony among the animals. And that changed world that broken world is the one we know. 
from the dead bird dragged in by the cat to the wildebeest, wildebeest that's taken down by a lion, we have witnessed the callousness of the natural world. Nature read in tooth and claw, as the poet Tennyson put it. But it wasn't so in God's original design, according to the biblical writers. The world, they say, has gone awry. Things are not as they should be in the animal kingdom or in the kingdoms of humankind. And kingship is, in fact, the subject of this passage we heard from Isaiah. This beautiful image of the peaceable kingdom has as its context the political reality of the nation of Israel. Actually, Judah at this time. Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of several kings, and the most notorious of them was King Ahaz of Judah. He ruled in a tumultuous time. Assyria had again risen as a regional power and was threatening its neighbors. And two of them invaded Judah and tried to force them into their anti-Assyrian coalition. But instead, Ahaz allied himself with Assyria and thereby saved himself. But in the process, Judah became a vassal state. Well, King Ahaz of Judah was impressed by the glitz and the glamour and the prestige of the Assyrians. He was impressed by both their politics and their religion, and he swore allegiance to their king and homage to their gods, and he introduced their worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And it is even recorded that he offered his own son to Moloch, a Canaanite god associated with child sacrifice. Well, as you might imagine, the Hebrew prophets condemned such rulers. Isaiah's criticism is implicit in several oracles about a future glorious ruler who would be filled with wisdom and knowledge and reverence for God and who would rule with righteousness and with fairness and who would show concern for the poor and for the meek. And associated with the reign of that ideal king is the advent of peace, a universal peace, a harmony among all of God's creatures. It is, in fact, a reversal of the fall. It is a return to Eden. Initially, the Hebrew people expected a human king to fulfill these wishes, one in the line of David, but when that Davidic line ran out and died, they began to look instead for a Messiah. And Christians, of course, came to identify this future ideal king as Jesus, who, come, who came among us as God's anointed to inaugurate God's reign and to usher in justice and righteousness and peace. Well, that reign, as we know, is as yet incomplete Violence and war, poverty and injustice persist. But Jesus planted a seed and called his followers to join in helping the kingdom to grow. That's what his ministry was about. It was about proclaiming God's rule of love and justice, grace and peace. There is still much to be accomplished. That much is obvious from viewing our world. And each Advent we hear again the call to join in ushering in God's kingdom. We hear it in the voice of the prophets, like Isaiah, and like John the baptizer, the one crying out in the wilderness of our world, calling us to repent, for the kingdom has come near. It has come near in Jesus. It comes near in his teaching that we are to Lift the lowly and side with the poor. It comes near in his teaching that we are called to love one another, including even our enemies. 
It comes near as he heals the sick and feeds the poor and welcomes the outcast. It comes near as he confronts the corruption of religious systems that promote legalism and practice exclusion. And it approaches as he challenges economic systems that favor the wealthy but oppress the poor. The kingdom is not yet here in all its fullness. That remains for us a future hope. And that peaceable kingdom where all God's creatures live together in perfect harmony, that has not yet arrived either. For it promises nothing less than a reversal of the fall and lies finally beyond history as we know it. But we anticipate it in faith because it is God's promise to us. And we can help to make that hope real by choosing to live life now in light of that future promise. We can heed the prophet's call to strive for justice, to show mercy, to care for the needy, to work for peace. To the degree that we are given the courage, one preacher writes, we can invite God's future into the present and practice it even now. And then the world of nature, red in tooth and claw, though it remains real, can be tempered by a new vision of a creation that sings God's praise because all are fed and all are loved. Advent calls us to remember our calling to join in ushering in such a world, a world of hope and a world of true peace. Amen. Our hymn of response today is on the Jordan's Bank, the Baptist's Cry. It is 96 in glory to God. Please stand as you are able. <laughs> Advent calls us into a particular faithfulness, a faithfulness of following Jesus in this wild world, proclaiming peace, working for justice, and offering hope to all people. And on that journey, we are offered sustenance. You find it at this table. Where here we have these tangible gifts that speak to us of God's grace. All who seek to follow Jesus are welcome at this table. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right indeed to give you thanks, O God. In the beginning, there was only you. We lived with you and we walked with you, and your presence was like the light of a thousand suns. And yet we turned from your light and walked into the darkness, hiding from the brightness of your glory. Even so, you did not turn from us, but sought us out to save us from our blindness and lead us from our wanderings into the light of day. Little by little, you revealed your life, your light, to Sarah and Abraham, through Jacob and Isaac, through Moses and David, through Mary and Joseph. You slowly uncovered the ember of our hope still burning. And you reveal to us, Jesus Christ, your anointed one, come to bring us hope and light and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with all the faithful of every time who seek your light. Holy, holy, holy God, the power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We thank you for sending Jesus into our world to satisfy the longings of your people, for a Savior to bring freedom to the captives and justice to the oppressed, and to inaugurate your reign of peace. He came among us as the light of the world, revealing your truth and demonstrating your love. We rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the promise of of new life and the sure hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ in your peaceable kingdom. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and wine, joyfully celebrating his dying and rising as we await his return. According to his commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. Holy God, pour out your spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be a communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, make us one with him and with all who share this feast and then send us out to be his body in and for the world. Today we offer prayers, O God, for Sally Crandall's brother, Jack, as he has injured his shoulder. We pray for Cindy Balaki and Irene Rome and others among our number who are in need of healing. And as we think today, especially of peace, O God, we pray for the people of Aleppo and Iraq and Nigeria and South Korea and all the people gathered at Standing Rock. We pray for people in every place where there is conflict or the potential for conflict, asking for your peace. Strengthen us in the power of your spirit to bring good news to the poor, to loose the chains of the oppressed, and to work for peace in your name. Keep us faithful in your service until that day when your reign shall be fully established and all your creation will live together in harmony. We pray this in Jesus' name and now say together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember how Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, and when they were together at table, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way also, Jesus took the cup following supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. 
as often as you drink it, you proclaim my death until I come again. Will the servers please come forward? Table is ready. All are welcome.
Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this meal shared around your table. And thanks for the grace that we have here received. May it strengthen us that we may be in your service, following Jesus Christ in the ways of peace. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 106 in Glory to God. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of God's peace.